Hello and welcome to this afternoon's um, session. Um, we are so pleased to have Lucy with us from the Financial Times. As a massive Financial Times fan myself, which I'm going to do my best to avoid going on about today because I do end up going on and on about how great it is. Um, we're going to focus today on data and insights, um, primarily from a point of view of marketing comms, but also um, more from a point of company as well. So if today is your first um, experience of a Marketing Forum event, then welcome. So my name is Katie Sando and the Marketing Forum is specifically um, for um, from micro to medium sized businesses. Um, having had my own experience of working in marketing teams and also as an individual in SMEs, um, I became quite aware that what was quite difficult was informal learning. So just having access to people like Lucy who could share their knowledge and can make me get better without having to go through, you know, formal qualifications and courses. So the aim of the Marketing Forum is to plug that gap, is just to give you access to those kinds of conversations and um, hear from people who are doing um, really good work uh, in, across the sector, basically. So communications, marketing and creative. So welcome. I hope you enjoy. Um, we have got a Q&A facility, which I have opened right now. So um, you are really welcome to ask questions, but I'm probably not going to answer them until um, towards the end. Um, or I get all distracted by all the questions buzzing in. Um, so um, you have to trust me for a minute to ask Lucy the right questions, but we will give you time at the end to, um, to ask your own. So thank you so much, Lucy, for joining us. Lucy Alexander, you're Head of Insight for the Financial Times. And um, if I'm not mistaken, you have um, analyst experience as well from Burberry, ASOS.com and research experience from Channel 4. Am I lying yet? No, you're not lying at all. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for joining us. So um, I wanted to start off by um, asking you about um, a slightly odd um, event title that I saw. So I was doing some research on um, what uh, Data and Insights is. <laughs> um, and um, I saw that you did a, a talk entitled Egyptian uh, Gods, A-B Testing and Early Peaking. Mm. And um, I was at most just intrigued as to the connection here between uh, Egyptian Gods, presumably, and A-B Testing. Uh, yeah, well, at the FT, the connection is extremely tight. I can tell you because our um, A-B testing tool is something that we built ourselves and um, it was built by a group of kind of slightly renegade developers and they decided to name it Amit, which is actually not strictly a god, but a kind of fearsome creature who ate the heart of people who had died and then judged whether or not they were sufficiently good to go on. Um, to kind of to a better place, I guess, essentially. Um, and that was our way of viewing A-B testing was that every product feature that came to us, we would either eat its heart and decline it and say, you know, you have to go back and try again, or we would let it go out into the wild and um, meet the consumers. And uh, early peaking was because I was constantly trying to establish some really firm guidelines around how we run tests at the FT. It's very tempting to kind of take that uh, take that technology and really run with it. Um, but actually, like many things, it has to be balanced with quite a lot of rigor. So that was me just essentially, it's just a nod to the fact that I'm constantly having a go at people for not setting things up rigorously enough. Oh, I was kind of excited to find out if it was sort of like a, an early peaking that you can you can peak too soon in your data insight knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, literally peaking as if under the duvets. Um, oh. oh, I completely got that. <laughs> Right. So, um, I think it makes start, uh, sense to start with the Financial Times. Um, yeah. And uh, so you, when we spoke, have talked about it as a, a data led organisation. And I suppose like as a starting point, what does that mean in real terms? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a kind of concept that's banded around slightly. And I guess the, the fundamental premise is that we are trying to come from a position of always having some objectivity in any decision that we make. It doesn't actually mean that um, data is always the last word, but it means that we have to incorporate data in all the decisions that we make. And 
that doesn't in any way undermine the incredible contribution of people's experience and their expertise in areas. Obviously, that's still fundamental. And trust me, going to the newsroom and trying to say that we're going to start making decisions with data gets you not very far um, often. Um, so we we do view it as a balance, but we have managed to integrate data at every point in our decision-making process, whether or not it's about a new product release or whether or not it's about understanding what time of day articles should be published and any, any kind of decision that we make. And that is something that's really been firm for about the last six years, probably. Um, and I think that that's where a lot of companies of a similar size to ours have been really investing heavily in this area in the last few years. And so I saw, and I don't know if you've just answered that question yourself, but so I've seen conflicting articles and conflicting information between data led and data driven. And is that, am I right in thinking that data led is what you've just said in that it, you're, you're using it to answer questions as opposed to you're just blindly following it? Yeah. And I, and I think that at the FT, we don't, the, the distinction between data led and data driven is kind of a little bit blurry. We probably would say that we're actually data driven rather than data led in the sense of we're not blindly following data and you can easily sort of overdo that. What you want is to balance uh, business efficiency with really sound reasoning and business efficiency often operates at a slightly quicker pace than really the most in-depth analysis might. Um, and so we try and be pragmatic wherever we can and we and we make sure that we are just a constructive voice rather than a blocker for anything that needs to be done and then I suppose my question after that was like does it even matter and I think you've just answered that as well so no it doesn't because you <laughs> the fundamental point is try and use data um to help your decision making it should not be like I think sometimes it's perceived as being a little bit too strict um and you're almost moving and like the data is driving the business and the people are no longer making those decisions but for us it's a very strong balance because we've got a very strong brand we can't undermine that by doing just random things that the data seems to be pointing out we have to try and use our common sense as well all the time right of course and so the Egyptian god or beast <laughs> that you built yes so tell me about that then so tell me so presumably so you said that's been in place so the, if the data decision making has been in place for about six years so that's a custom built analytics program at the FT it's been a big evolution and uh, we are quite idiosyncratic in some ways and as much as we do often build our own analytics tools and that comes with many pros and it comes with some also cons but the FT is unusual in as much as it released a subscription model very early in the game um, before any other newspaper did and we just had a firm commitment that this would be the way that our business would grow and it proved to be right and what it meant was we just had this vast amount of customer data um, very very early on and just like so much information about what they were doing on the website and and who they were and it's a heavy responsibility to have that kind of data because you not only have your kind of moral and ethical obligations and things like that but also you want to make sure that you're making good decisions with the data and you're using it in an appropriate way um, and from that was kind of the ground up build of all of our tools that we use today and the positive side of that is we have huge flexibility we can really manipulate the data in a very very broad range of ways and the downside to that is it's quite expertise heavy um it's not easy for people to interact with our data who aren't within the data team um so those are some conflicts that we have and from that kind of attitude came our decision to build our own a b testing platform and that has been an incredible learning curve because it's not the simplest thing in the world to do um the actual mechanism is quite straightforward but building a testing culture is quite hard and also balancing a thirst to test with also your kind of technical setup, which might not be necessarily perfectly suited to that. Um, really embedding it in people's work patterns is very hard because mostly people are just happy to release and see what happens and just check to see whether or not anything is broken on the other side of that. Um, and uh, we really had to just say, no, we're going to, from now on, we're going to be really sensible about this we're going to measure everything up front we're going to see what kind of risk we're exposing ourselves to before we launch it and um that influenced our decision to uh, build our ab testing tool and a lot of it was technically based because we had a testing tool called maximizer which is a very big one um uh quite quite well known within the kind of the, the sphere um and what it does it actually changes the front of your website 
after you've deployed it. And that's not always a great user experience uh, for the for the person who's actually trying to interact with the website. And not only that, but there are some other performance issues. It slows your website down. It does all kinds of other things. And we just decided that was not the route we wanted to go down any longer. Um, and then five years later, it's been like nonstop work, kind of corralling this A-B testing platform into a really um, good, into a good tool. Um, and the upshot of that is we have a kind of balance now that we have this tool Amit that we've built with like unlimited flexibility. And then on the other side, we have Optimizely, which is another competitor to Maximizer, which is an off the shelf tool, very customizable, but still um, a lot less flexibility in there, but really kind of quick to use and easy for other people to use. So we've come to another balance. I think that would probably be um, sort of one of the, the many, many themes that runs through my life. We're trying to find the balance between what the business needs and what we would like to have um, from a data perspective. Mm. So, um, in terms of that A-B testing then, so presumably that underpins quite a lot of the testing that you're doing. And is that, uh, this is probably where I expose my complete ignorance around data and insights. Uh, I'm a fraud. Um, uh, so is there, do you, is there like automated like AI that drives the changing from the data or is that data that you then interpret and feed back or in terms of the website does it autom or is it automatic uh so how it works like you know in a nutshell is the only thing that that particular tool amit really does is it offers two different or three different or four different experiences and it randomizes the users that come to the site so that every bucket that we have so if we've got the thing that we normally see here and then the change that we want to see here, you get a random selection of people seeing each one so that we can compare the results. And like fundamentally, that's what it does. And it does that totally automatically. Um, any interpretation of the data, like which actually won that test, which of those headlines was the more successful or which of those colors was the more appealing, we have to do the analysis for, and that's totally bespoke. Um, so one of my analysts would sit down and actually run that set of results individually because there are an infinite number of permutations that we could have changed and uh, it's not it's not automatable in the system that we currently have it. Okay, that answers my question. <laughs> so, um, so one of the other things you touched on that I'm really interested in is the idea of um, like embedding this within a culture. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easy to think about data analysis as being like, a team and for data collection to be like a set of individuals and uh presumably um there the culture at F, at the ft has to embed this data and insight based decision making yeah and um it's been it i think it's very different depending on the type of industry that you work in in general so uh coming from a newspaper as I do at the moment, it helps that the FT is a very data-y newspaper. I mean, it publishes financial information and it, it's not afraid of a chart, for example. But I have worked in organizations where there's genuinely a real aversion to being presented with a table or a chart and there's a real um, lack of expertise and there's also a fear of them of interpreting them wrongly and not really um, quite understanding and also just finding it boring, uh, to be honest. And that that depends a bit on the department as well. And so to embed this within teams and within departments, you really have to show the worth of what you're, you're offering. And typically that's just in results. I mean, ultimately it comes down to, um, are you selling more of a particular product that you want to sell? Or, you know, do you have a better understanding of, of what you're doing? Are you able to make these decisions more easily? And also do you feel much more confident about the decision decisions that you are making? And so I think that the role that data has been playing for a long time has been proving its worth and uh, kind of trying to explain why it is so helpful to have a really solid grasp of, of what you're doing. And that, doesn't have to be super sophisticated. That is just a matter of um, each department knowing their own numbers incredibly well. You know, we're talking about the reporting level here, the kind of thing that we potentially receive on a Monday morning and, and have to understand in order to go to briefings and, and various team meetings, like knowing just your basic numbers, the metrics that really matter to your particular department. That's the starting point. And then at the other end of the spectrum is, you know, data science and having a lot of models and having artificial intelligence program stuff. But you don't need that in order to have a really great data driven culture. You just need to be 
open to understanding what's happening with your customers at a kind of objective level. Okay. Let's dig into that a little bit more in a bit, because obviously SMEs over here um, and particularly micro as well, um, in terms of uh, cap- capacity, capability, resource to do things like build. <laughs> but I mean, obviously building those bespoke systems would never be, uh, you know, anything near like what we would be able to do. But certainly it would be great to dig into more around that. But so on the kind of data culture, um so your team deliver insights into the senior management and the board at board level. Have, have they had to be trained in terms of interpreting some of this? Or is that is that your guys' responsibility to make sure it is interpretable? Yeah, the, the how it's interpreted is our responsibility. Um, we don't just shove it out there and allow it to kind of take on a life of its own because it's very... <laughs> yeah good luck little number um like no we we really corral that number and we try very hard to make sure that the message as we understand it is the message that is taken further um my team so there are three teams within the ft that look at the the big data and the big data side of things there's the reporting team who produce um reports for anyone in the business and that that's kind of your uh how much traffic are you getting and like slicing that by country and region and device type and all of that kind of stuff. So just your actual core numbers. My team look at the business questions and do analysis on it. So they try and answer something which is a little bit more theoretical. And then there's another team which is data science and they look after the model building. And um, each one of those has a really specific place. But within my team, we are looking at driving strategy with our analyses we're actually looking at really providing a a guidance as to where the business should be going um, based on what our customers are doing and um, how our customers are interacting with the the newspaper at the moment Um, but yeah we have a we do try and keep a pretty firm hold on what the message is because it's very very easy to misinterpret it and we're all familiar with uh, what we've done but if you just give a number to somebody else there's many many ways in which it can be um sadly (laughs) misunderstood and I think that that actually can be quite harmful so yeah we really do try and make sure that we're on top of that from beginning to end. Do you think that so do you think the board have had training around that as a or or how do you know that they have or? Um, It's a good question we had a we have a board member um so our we had a chief data officer who's called Tom Betts who is um uh, within our circles, kind of just wildly well known and, and beloved, uh, and so he did a really great job in training them because he was just there, a, a voice for kind of, he was always a voice for data. And I would say many, many of the board members are really, really sound on this. A couple of them are, are less comfortable, but um, the majority, I would say, are not requiring training and are already like fully there. Saying that, where we do need a bit more help sometimes is um, to kind of make people understand uh, outside of their own slightly partisan world because, you know, a marketing person always thinks of things with a marketing interpretation and editorial person and, and trying to make our numbers as objective as possible that support the business as a whole and not a department specifically. That's a, that's a challenge. Selling it, basically selling your idea to um, a board member who might be inherently opposed to it because it might go against what their interests are specifically that's all so can you talk to me a little bit more about data collection so um i think from what you said before most of the data that you guys are interpreting is your own data you're not looking at you know other research papers uh so the data that we work with on a day-to-day basis is our own and um we have enough of that to keep us busy and there are not enough questions around that uh, to keep us busy. We use external sources of data, so freely available sources of data, which you can get from governments and that kind of thing. Um, If we want to add elements that we don't have, you know, there are lots of things that we need to learn about just populations as a whole that inform our analyses and we get them from third parties. Uh, We are informed by research that other people do, but we don't necessarily integrate that into our analysis. Then you've got the journalists who manage data. So there are data journalists as well, and they would be using publicly available data in order to understand what's going on in the world. So that that's the difference there for us. Okay. Um, what another thing that I was interested from because I, I 
<laughs> I ha- as an SME and maybe you know the guys on the call like if you want to drop it into the Q&A or in the chat so my experience is that it's, it's rare for me to come across a, a business where they are super data centered um and um so I suppose um a, a question for you around that you know ha- having worked in these companies that no doubt you know are but you also have the capacity to be do you think that initiative has to come from the board do you think that has to be a kind of like drop down approach or do you think that it's something that you know we could all start like upwardly managing and saying actually do you know what this under is underpinned um I think it obviously helps hugely if it is driven by the board because there's your buy-in and there's a lot less time spent trying to convince people but I definitely feel like even when I've worked at companies where there's only been six people, um, if one of them is just completely analytically minded or just really curious about how their particular area works and just really keen on this kind of thing, it very quickly spreads um, because all it demonstrates is you're much less likely to be surprised or shocked by something that happens because you're probably able to predict that it might happen in advance, or at least you're aware of the variances that you see day to day. And I've always been so impressed by those people because it doesn't, you don't actually have to have any kind of background in this area at all. It's just simply you're fearless when it comes to looking at your own numbers and you're happy to incorporate them in the kind of decision-making that you do. And I think that there's, there's nothing to stop individuals from taking this approach in their own realm. Um, but it, obviously, it's very helpful to get buy-in, <laughs> um, especially if you want to devote time to it, because it's, it is quite time-consuming to get started, I think. Yes. I mean, I suppose there's ways that you can, you know, if you're trying to develop a new product and you want to use data to underpin that, or you're trying to you know, um, put um, evidence why advertising should be placed in a certain area, but... Um, you know, you can then kind of evidence what your hypothesis is. Um, but, you know, that's completely different, I think, to then having, a you know, an organisation which is really um, investing in in those kinds of um, collection tools as well and, and measuring. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was sort of like the, I know we touched on it a little bit, but like the bespoke models versus like automation is this a kind of um is this something is there a, is there a best practice around this stuff not well <laughs> um impossible question it so depends on your ambition in the sense of where do you actually want to go with your data and i've known companies like i won't mention the specific name of this company but it's well-known to all of us and they have um 150 data scientists 1500 engineers and they just allow their data to guide their website like they don't have any interference with it whatsoever human wise they just entirely leave it to algorithms and they know that the algorithms will optimize for conversion rate and that is all that they care about ultimately see um this is a relatively new company and what they're not encumbered with is a huge pressure of brand um for us at the ft we would never ever dream of going anywhere near that like we are a very person-centric company in the sense of we are built around editors and journalists and um that kind of expertise and so we always have to think about everything that we do with that film of how does this fit within what we're doing um as a brand so i think that um, we tend to be quite bespoke in our approach. Um, we like to do analysis that answers a really specific question rather than a general question, and that lends itself to bespoke type of work. Um, on the other hand, we have a ton of automated reports. I mean, we don't want to spend any time doing reporting over and above literally constructing it for the first time and then letting it go and live. We don't want to be spending our time on that. So there's automation to improve efficiency, um, but we really value the bespoke time because we're talking about something really quite niche mostly. Um, And then further, you've got sort of the data science end and that's automated. That's about models working for you based on what you know. And um, so I feel like most big companies would be a big combination of, of those two. And then with the smaller companies, it does tend to be quite bespoke up front because it's all about, um, getting to know things and and setting things up so that you've got 
uh, you've got that great foundation to build upon of like really solid reporting and an analysis where you've got enough data and that kind of thing. Um, those things can definitely be automated. And I would really, really in, in recommend investing time in automation at that early stage, because um, what you want is to have a wide range of things, but you don't really want to be spending all your time on it. And I've noticed that many companies spend, um, you know, Monday morning compiling reports and things that is uh, typically like a real huge investment time wise. And it's can be quite demoralizing for the person. Doing it. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've, I've been there. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people have been there Monday morning. Sucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, that's I think it's really interesting what you said so it's about objective setting here so you know how so and and have you got any um have you got any insights yourself from how like what kind of those objectives might look like how to kind of dive dive into them yeah so actually we should have probably already hit objective setting because it's so fundamental but but effectively um there are many kind of uh templates you can follow for a really solid objective setting um one that we use which is um kind of a one which is well known within the various industries, but particularly tech is called OKRs, which is about objectives and key results. So you have your objective, which might be um, get X number of new readers. And then you have your key results, which would be how you would individually like go about doing that. And I think the most important thing for us objectives wise is to make sure that they are measurable and that they are deliverable, obviously, um, but that you actually know once you've hit them um, and that they are, not so out of the question difficult that you're not going to hit them but they're equally like stretching enough and we put a lot of time into sizing up various opportunities working to prioritize which ones are the most um potentially lucrative for us or effective and then um setting a reasonable number of objectives uh so that we can deliver those particular um aims but yeah it's a it's a really meaty subject actually and um, we have increasingly pivoted the work that we do to meet the way of measuring objectives within the company so that we're able to be focused and we can prioritize because we only have a relatively small team. We're not millions of us and we need to be um, fairly disciplined about how we approach these things. And so would you, in, in that kind of sense, you know, I know you, it was only an example where you say like, okay, excellent new readers. So that's the kind of objective that you would sh set and share with the say marketing sales team or whatever it is, and that you guys would um, decide on how you're going to measure that between you, or presumably you're not operating in isolation around those kinds of objectives. No. So part of being kind of, I guess, part of being embedded is that we don't op operate in isolation really ever. Um, in, in those scenarios, we would probably be working in like a multidisciplinary group um, as opposed to just one department. In fact, we try not to work in a kind of individual departmental way. For us, um, you know, growing subscriptions and encouraging people to read our newspaper is an entire company right. wide objective. You know, this is for everyone to be working for. And we have specific metrics which we call north star metrics that's a kind of concept which is increasingly kind of gaining traction but essentially it means that the whole company is working towards the same deliverables and it's really clear what everyone's working towards and there's um no ambiguity about what one should be prioritizing in terms of efforts so that has been very very helpful for us in terms of guiding the, the direction that everyone pulls in Man, there's like so many learnings there, like a lot of stuff, I think, uh, from a marketing sales sort of perspective, um, often um, marketing and sales tend to be considered only the responsibility of marketing and sales. And I think, you know, embedding in company culture, like um, a sense of like, actually, we all should be following, we all want to be marketing the company and, and selling our product or service. It's kind of the same. There's a lot of embedding that we should all be <laughs> considering there, Lucy. That's it. And it's a shared responsibility like that. There, It's very easy to form silos. Very, very easy. And uh, this the, the kind of idea of a North Star metric or of a shared objective for everyone is really helpful in slightly breaking those things down, because there really is no one in our company that shouldn't be contributing towards making sure that FT is read as widely as possible. Like we all believe it's an amazing product. So if we're all embedded and committed to that particular um, idea, then it makes sense that we should all be working towards the same goal. Yeah. Just because marketing have the budget necessarily to go out and, and um, 
you know, really meet the audience in a way that somebody in product might not be able to, or somebody in data might not be able to. Nevertheless, everything we should be doing should be trying to push towards that. And it's just great for, for making sure that you keep focused, I think. For sure. So I wanted to dig a little bit more into the SMEs because um, most of us, unless a few people have sneaked past, um, which is fine, you're welcome here, um, <laughs> are, are micro and SMEs. And so um, completely different um, in many ways, you know, budget, um, you know, in terms of so I think in many ways, it's easier to turn culture within small businesses. So if you wanted to embed something, but in other ways, you know, for example, like family business, owner managed businesses, it can be difficult to kind of um, uh, get logic approved. And um, and why not? It's your company. Um, but uh, so I suppose I wanted to pick your brains a little bit in a more maybe practical way. So if you're not in a data led company, but you wanted to start embedding it, where do you start? Um, conscious that like a small business or a large business actually could operate really in any number of ways like you might have a website you might not have a website you might have customer data you might not like I don't know there's just so many different starting points but really the fundamental starting point is that you are um, curious about what your customer is doing Um, curious about how your customer is using your product um, and curious about the data that you do hold and I think that it's that comfort and curiosity which is really the foundational layer because that is more powerful than anything else having that curiosity is, is the most important starting point once you're there then it's about laying your foundational level and that is that is always going to be your reporting level and um, even if that's just you looking at your own numbers routinely um, that's a great start and I there are lots of ways in which you can take the information that you have uh, that you own and try and work with it it depends it depends on the scale it depends on the type of data that you have um, but ultimately it's very unlikely that if you have any decent amount of data that you couldn't use that to really get some very valuable insight but it's but you probably do need to start off by um understanding what direction you're pushing in what your what your key metric is what your north star metric is that you can try and work towards and um how you can use your data in order to understand that better um but yeah it's hard without examples specifically to I think because like you say everyone's so different and the industries are so different but um so in terms of is that where you're saying like at the beginning once you've kind of set those decisions around what we're going to measure that's where you sort of say it, it's worth investing in making sure that you can kind of automate some of that not necessarily data collection but data interpretation yeah and I think that um so I don't know if you have a website very often now if you've built that using a certain amount of like if you built it using a templated format um that often comes with analytics or you can use a free analytics tool like google analytics it's actually amazing what google analytics will do um it's you know really really high power considering um the level of investment required is you know always nil apart from a bit of putting your own pixels on the website or whatever it is. Um, there shouldn't be too much interpretation required from that. You should be able to get a lot of really good data just by looking, like literally just by looking and reading. There is there is no number crunching required for a lot of that reporting. Um, but if you do get to the point where you want to start um, doing more sophisticated stuff, say you have already a fully established website, there's quite a bit of traffic to it and you want to understand that, then uh, there's a lot to be said for investing in people who are, or just time of someone, so it doesn't have to be obviously full-time employees, but it could just be a bit of expertise to look over what you've got and give you some advice on what kind of direction that you maybe could think about going in or just what you would want to be optimizing or where your pain points are or where the customers are really struggling to use what you have. Um, same could be said for feedback. So it doesn't have to be actual behavioral data. It could be actually customer feedback and that kind of thing. Um obviously that's a lot more subjective but that is incredibly rich in terms of directional information and that accounts as great data um so yeah i would depending on what kind of data you've got access to um there should be a lot of foundational level stuff that you can do to jump start where you are on that spectrum even with things like google analytics so if you're making assumptions about what certain um numbers mean 
Um, mm. I think we can get better at that though. So for example, if you see, so <laughs> this is not unreal, exciting, it is a real example. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I had a client where um, pretty much the most visited page on their website by an absolute long shot was um, what, what did they do? And um, I like to interpret that as um, clearly they are not in any way communicating well at all what they actually deliver. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if the first thing that people are looking at, I could very wrong, be very, very easily be wrong about that kind of interpretation. Is there like reading we could do about getting better about it, uh, getting better with it? Or, <laughs> or is that just, you know, I mean, I think this is where experience is important and being around people who experience, but yeah. equally there must be a way where we could be like, okay, I'm, my bias is involved here. Yeah. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. And actually I can think of an example, which is sort of similar to that, not quite, not quite in that extreme, but similar. Um, so we had a certain journey through the website, um, which often ended in a conversion. And everyone was like, yes, we've got to basically get more people to do this journey. And what they were missing was that it wasn't that this journey in itself was helping people convert. It was that people who wanted to convert already did this journey. And um, you're right to say that there's basically like this big layer of interpretation, which sits over everything. And um it can be very, very hard to unpick. And I think that one good way of doing that would be, and you don't need a lot of data for this, is to ask a few customers mm. why why they were doing that. Um, you know, feedback, qualitative feedback, in addition to your kind of quantitative data, that is the marriage of dreams because ultimately you've got the richness there of someone actually telling you what they were thinking with the like hard fact of lots of people did this, it's probably the same thing. Mm. Um, and I think if you're looking at something and you think I have literally no idea why this is happening. <laughs> um, if you have, if you have customers that you're friendly enough to call and we do this all the time, we call random members of our subscription base and just ask them how they're doing and how they're enjoying the product. And um, yeah, Katie, you might get a call. That might be me. <laughs> it, could be you. And it would be a, it would be a very senior person calling you um, to find out. And yeah, I think we do that to keep in touch because you don't ever want to lose touch of what like the actual customer is trying to do. And yeah, if everyone is trying to work out what the heck your business is doing and going to the like, what does this even mean page? Then there probably is a problem. Yeah. Mm. And um, so one of the things you talked about is that even with our much smaller uh, levels of data um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there is a spectrum of businesses on the call. So some people might, it might just be website data, it might be sales data, where they'd be able to interpret trends. You know, some people will have like vast quantities of data. Yeah. Um, but even with the smaller volumes, so you've talked about how we can use it to make better decisions. And um, is that all part of like just the approach? Um, or do you just think that it just helps underpin decision making? Um, partly it's approach because if you, if you try and take the approach that you are going to have at least one objective point per decision making, like if you're going to have to back up with some hard fact, um, any decision that you make, it changes the way you make decisions and it sort of slightly slows the decision making process down, but in a way which is constructive. Um, there's a lot of people still um, at any company that I've worked at who really believe that ultimately like the decision that they make just with their own instinct is probably likely to be borne out by the data. And that is possible because, you know, there's, there's no substitute for expertise, but um, the best decision makers I know are ones that are most open to information, albeit from other people or from numbers and are like the least defensive about the decision-making process. And I think that um, encouraging that is a really important starting point <laughs> I'm not against that um, <laughs> I don't know if my face was just like oh no um yeah I'd rely on gut um so um, and then another question kind of on that note is around what was I going to ask you um a oh, uh, trends risk like analysis so um yeah can, so you must use your existing data to help predict trends. Yeah, so um, we do quite a bit of predictive work. 
that's that's harder obviously um because it's much easier to say what has happened um than what what might happen um and we're in a slightly odd industry for too much prediction because we are very dependent on the news cycle like we would have had a hard time predicting the last four years I can tell you and um that that just you know that just carries on um (laughs) so we do our best I mean obviously there are things like seasonal trends which give you a huge amount of guidance around um whether or not uh, things are likely to continue in roughly the same way unless you have an um, unbelievably odd event happening which we constantly do seem to be having <laughs> so yeah those kinds of those kinds of trends and predictive work are very very important but I would say that they are slightly further along the sophistication spectrum the most starting point is just what has happened like what is actually happening right now and what has happened in the past um but predictive work is, is brilliant if you can do it and I think if you have a really reliable for example, seasonal cycle, um, that can be very, very helpful. And also just in setting targets and goals as well. Yeah, sure. So um, one more um, little group of questions from me, and then we will hand over to the Q&A. So um, we've got a couple of questions through already, Lucy, brace yourself. Um, (laughs) No, that's not true. Um, uh, So if you've got any more questions, guys, please do feel free to chuck them over. So the last um, thing I really wanted to ask you about was analysis. Mm-hmm. and um being an analyst so what is there best practice around what makes a good analyst yes I think so um so I am an unconventional analyst in the sense of I did a French degree and um that is not the typical path into this industry I can tell you but basically the the I do a a ridiculous amount of interviewing. I am always interviewing and I love it as a, as a part of the job, because what you're looking for are a few attributes as opposed to qualifications. We have sort of a benchmark level of qualification that we require in order to um, sort of just to do the, do the basic job. Um, And that has to do slightly with qualifications, although not completely. And it has to do with just um, sort of an enthusiasm for data, obviously. But fundamentally, we are just interested in people who are curious and um, we don't really mind what background they come from. They have to be analytical in the way that they approach things. They have to be objective in the way that they look at things and they have to be not scared of of the data and not scared to jump in. Um, But beyond that, we're looking just for like interested thoughtful people um and and that's are basically how we how we hire uh, entirely based on <laughs> our instinct and not data. no it's it's actually based on you know good solid principles but we work very very hard to try and make sure that the analysts we recruit from are um not just all the same identical person and have we have a good interesting mixture of opinions and ways of working and approaches to things because we have some who are highly mathematical like very very scholarly in their approach and they churn out analyses that read like white papers and they're just unbelievably rigorous and we have to say to them like you know you have to hurry this up now and then on the other end of the spectrum we've got these incredibly charismatic storytellers who are amazing at convincing senior management that they should be moving in a particular direction and are just so able to weave the proper story of it and then we have people who sit in between but fundamentally they are all curious and all interested okay so it is that's what I suspected Lucy because you know if within it within a team you don't want everyone to have the same skill set anyway and I you know I was assuming that but I mean I I suppose my assumption with no data analysis behind it whatsoever was that kind of a broad view of the world can be quite helpful so that you're not so um you know you don't want people that are robotic when you're trying to make commercial decisions presumably no and you also don't want an echo chamber and um QAing and um kind of peer reviewing is a big part of what we do and we have people who are amazing at that, who actually go through and like really line by line work out whether or not someone's got their methodology right. And on the other hand, we've got people who are much more concerned with just like, have you grasped the concept? Like, you know, are you actually even answering the business question and have you thought about the business question? And do you understand why they would have asked that? And so we need that mix. And um, because you know, we recruit slowly over time. People come in, we have new roles available. Uh, we just do, but just naturally get this really interesting, diverse bunch and they're absolutely outstanding. So I would definitely recommend just the hiring interest, interesting people. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Some of them are very intimidating, actually. Their CVs are really, really disturbingly packed full of amazing stuff. And then other people, it's a lot less kind of established and clear on paper. And then they come in and they're just fantastic. So it's, yeah, it's a really good mix. So you said that you don't want them to be scared of the data, diving into the data. Do you literally mean because of the volume and the, the because it's presumably highly numerical? Yeah. Volume is intimidating. Fear of doing something wrong and breaking stuff is a big one. Um, like not, not being comfortable uh, to just go in and see if you can work out what things might mean. Um, you know, really being worried about misinterpreting things and forgetting that ultimately it's all really logical. And that if you just have a bit of confidence in the logic, it will probably all play out. Like the person who designs the way the data is structured has thought about it. And, you know, you have to put some faith in the fact that it's not going to be complete chaos in there. It's going to be, there's going to be method and you just need to find it. Yeah, right. You just got to see the pattern sort of thing. You've just got to you've got to trust that you're you're doing it sensibly. Um, most people do, and it's and it's that fear of kind of not not wanting to do something wrong that often just paralyzes people and stops them from even starting. Oh man, man, <laughs> get out! Okay, so we're going to have a look at questions from the audience. Hello, Robert Rush. Nice to see you. Um, and. Here's one from him. So he says, as a market researcher, I'm always being asked by clients what surprises have emerged from the data. Usually we're confirming assumptions or we realize priorities, rather, but rarely are there out and out surprises. So without breaking any confidences, when's the last time you found some assumptions were completely blown apart by the data or the business direction of travel was changed as a result of a new insight? I'm happy for you to break confidences, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'm sure the lawyers that they have to on standby watching. Um, <laughs> yeah, so surprises, my gosh. Right. This is a, this is a, an interesting and great question. Um, the biggest wealth of surprises have come from running A-B tests for us because uh, you start with your hypothesis and it actually forces you to upfront state what you expect to happen. And then there you go and you present it to people and they behave really differently to your expectations. And that's been wonderful for us because firstly, it's reminded us we are not our customer and we shouldn't just assume that because we like it, they will. Um, and the opposite, just because, yeah, I mean, I can tell you the time that we slightly hid where the crossword was and my God, it was complete carnage. We had to resurface that link very, very quickly. Um, oh my God. But there, there have been things where we have approached something in the same way that we approached it a couple of years earlier. And we found that the time had just totally moved on. Like that was no longer something that we could do. And uh, how, how people responded in the past was just very different how they're responding today. Um, and again, without breaking any confidences, I can tell you that that happened about two months ago. Um, and it was a real revelation. Like the expectations of the business were for something to happen a roughly 10 times as many times as it did. And so we just, we had a benchmark in our mind and it was just wildly out. And what we had to then do was just think, okay, actually, is there something that people are any longer interested in doing? And the answer might well be no. Um, and that's wonderful because that forces some creativity into the process. Um, but it happens to us all the time, literally, Robert, every day. <laughs> I, there's never a day where I'm not like, wow, that's surprising. And I and I think that um, that probably shows that we're ans- asking sufficiently kind of meaty questions. Sorry. Very loud announcement. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on that note, did you say, so firstly, did you say that the um, you made an assumption that it was significantly more than what did happen? Mm. okay massively more and um afterwards we tried to establish where this assumption had come from and no one would own up to it Um, but at some point someone had produced some credible evidence that this might happen and um it really showed us that we had been laboring under the assumption that this would be a viable option for a long time and actually it just wasn't anymore um and it's it's very refreshing to have that suddenly swept off the table um but yeah i would say like with av testing it happens to us all the time Maybe testing something actually I wouldn't mind picking up on. So um, do you li- you literally do it with everything then through the through the um, software that you guys have? So we try every every time that we create a new feature or change something significant, we test it. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, where it comes to our conversion funnel, we are a little bit more just we want constant te- testing. So it doesn't have to be a new release or something. We just 
try and play with that a lot. Okay. And A, and a B testing, so it, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? So, so actually, this is something that you guys find is really does help the process. Yes, because it's almost the only analysis that you can do where you can ascribe cause. And, you know, you can make a number of changes and then you can have a look and see how that impacts your traffic. But ultimately, to really separate how much of that impact was down to this feature versus potentially something else that happened in any possible variable in the world um, is very, very tough. But if you can A, B test it, then it, you get a really, really clear steer on how that's going to perform in the real world, albeit with some caveats. It's not perfect either, but it's the clearest way of gauging risk, of gauging how much uplift you're going to see, um, all of those things, yeah. Because you would be just getting to know your customer to an extent as well. Yeah, and also to st- like to stay on the like on the more humble side. Like I say, you know, we're always realizing that we are so imperfect when it comes to knowing our customer. You know, it's you it become you become quite arrogant, especially if you've been there a long time and thinking that you just understand what they're going to like, and then they really show you that you have you know that they don't or that they choose a different thing to the one that you expected. And yeah, it's really constantly refreshing. Hmm. Refreshing, irritating. (laughs) 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 Um, So we had another question. Um, I'm not sure if we already answered this one. What sort of analytical questions are you trying to answer at the Financial Times mostly? Um, Quite a a range of stuff, actually. Um, I'll give you some examples of the kind of analysis that we do. Um, So for a long time, our newsroom operated to a similar model um, as it used to do when we primarily produced a print uh, version of the, the paper. So print for us now is secondary to the digital side of things in terms of volume. Um, and they hadn't changed at all their behaviours in the newsroom without publication times. And we were able to show them that if we just shifted our publication times, we would enormously increase the readership of these articles. And it was just a no-brainer. It was around when people were commuting and when people were going home and during people's lunch breaks and stuff like that. It was just when people were accessing the information. Um, but that was that was definitely something which was um, very groundbreaking. Um, another thing that we did, which was um, very important to us, was we wanted to understand the relationship between having a quick website and having an engaging website. And we ran a test where we slowed the website down um, by one, two and three seconds. And we found out that for every second that we slowed the website down, ultimately it ended up costing us about a million pounds. And that kind of information allowed us then to invest very heavily in like the performance of the website and making sure that we were always really quick because if that is if that is what it takes to to make sure that you're protecting that kind of level of money um you're very very careful about things that you just add in uh that could potentially be slowing it down god it's so dumb well so i mean great that you can actually justify you can massively evidence justification for that kind of investment but equally how depressing is it that like a two second difference is how that's how impatient we now are but i you can it sounds crazy when you think about it but in practice if a website takes me two seconds to load i'm so irritated already i've got to really want it to stick around and i think you know we're there's like like it or not we're in a world now where people are very very savvy digitally and you have to try and um you know meet their expectations and like having a really slow website is just it's just not acceptable in this day and age I, mean, I suppose you might not know the answer to the question, but it's a question that I'm like pretty personally interested in, I suppose, around. So 2020, difficult year for all. <laughs> um, when stuff like this is going on, when you've got things like the um, elections in America, and do you find that actually the opposite of what you... Ex- so? I suppose my assumption would be, are people consuming more news? But actually, do you end up in a position where people just want to consume less because it's just too much to bear? (laughs) Oh, well, uh, yes, it is too much to bear. I mean, I I think that the the short answer is, yes, they are consuming more news and they're consuming more credible news. Um, So people are running to kind of safe haven news outlets where they anticipate getting something which is accurate Mm. and particularly around things like the election and it's very very hard to um satisfy people's expectations of unbiased reporting there um you have to really really be unbiased and people are very perceptive about potential bias that you're introducing so um we did notice that 
over time, I mean, Brexit was an absolutely enormous news event. Um, but people do feel just drained by it. And, um, you know, the relentless bad news is a bit overwhelming. And I think that, yeah, with any of these things, there is a point of fatigue where you actually are just like, just can't hear it. I just don't want to know. Like, I literally just can't handle what's happening. Um, financial Times readers are, tend to have quite a high threshold of just wanting to know even if it's awful or like or you know whatever's happening they're just keen to kind of have a sense of what's going on in the world so that that has been um quite nice for us in the sense of at least we're we've got a big audience to kind of share these things with but presumably you can predict when they might need to start moving forwards with the different subjects topics or do you just kind of have to not it's hard because if it's if it is what the editorial team think is the most important story of the day that is what matters they're not going to start changing the so actually this is quite an important point but like for we do not touch the home page we don't like we do not ever have any impact on what is on the home page because that is like sacred territory and it's very important to our readers that they know that that's been curated by the editorial board mm-hmm. and not by some random algorithm in the background and um that that human interaction is extremely important to them. So effectively, if Ruler, who is our editor, believes that um, that story should go on the front page, it goes on the front page, however people <laughs> feel about it. Um, and and that's that's the great thing. That's what we all stand by and yeah. believe in. You just send him a report afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. but like, they would carry on anyway. <laughs> carry yeah, on. Well, and yeah, you know, like you say, that's, that's why the FT has its reputation for its authority and its integrity. It's because you, you know, it does. Yeah, definitely. I'm not, I'm not going to go on about how good it is. Um, <laughs> Maybe a little baby come in the background. Oh no, she's just <laughs> like, Oh, great. Well, on that note, Lucy, I will let you go. Um, um, thank you so much for joining us. I really, as somebody who is not, um, you know, I haven't got the experience of being super, um, data analytical I'm sure I'd be great um shout out to the language degree students <laughs> yeah um but um uh, but it's been so useful to understand from you know the financial times perspective and your perspective and I think there's been a lot of learning in what you've said so thank you so so much for joining us and thank you everybody for joining us today and I probably will share a recording of this so if you'd like to go back over and um re-listen to anything that Lucy said then please do. And also while I'm here, if you're a freelancer, um, we have um, a session next Tuesday at lunch very quickly for 45 minutes on covering your butt with uh, contracts that include uh, data processing agreements. Um, So if you're anything like me and you're not sufficiently covered, (laughs) um, then um, it's another free one. So do go and have a look. All right. Thank you so much, Lucy. I'll let you go and um, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye, everyone.